we hear a, an external speaker uh, to talk to conference. Um, and I'm delighted that it is Professor uh, James Mitchell from Strathclyde University. This is a repeat uh, gig for, for James, who has uh, delivered the address, the lecture before, including in 1994, which is a, a very special date for me. That's in 1994 when I joined the Scottish National Party. <laughs> Thank you for that. Now, James has, has addressed us before, and he uh, has 25 years in academia, including a couple of years in the University of Sheffield. He's a renowned expert on nationalism, regionalism, uh, multi-level government, and devolution. He's also in the University College London in the Constitution Unit, and he's on the Advisory Committee on Policy Making in the Office of the First Minister at the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, James's knowledge of the past is almost unparalleled, having carried out a, an in-depth analysis and survey of uh, party members, so he knows uh, a lot about us, maybe more uh, than most. You might wonder, so, so why is he uh, addressing us today? I fear that it might be to promote his new book. <laughs> The Scottish National Party Transition to Power. I like the title, but I haven't had a preview, so I don't know whether to recommend it or not yet. I'm sure it'll be thoughtful. Uh, it can be pre-ordered from a large supplier, but I won't be giving them free promotion from the, from the stage. That might be a matter for you, Professor. Uh, two previous books include Devolution in the United Kingdom and Governing Scotland. An interesting fact about Professor Mitchell is that he's recently taken up kayaking, and he lives near Faz Lane, so that must be quite interesting, the security <laughs> at Faz Lane. So I would like to invite Professor James Mitchell to give the Donaldson Lecture to Party Conference. Thanks, Derek. Um, I'm not here uh, to promote my book, um, which uh, is published next month by Oxford <laughs> University Press uh, for £30. If you want it for less than that, the Scots Independent have done a deal with my publisher, um, and uh, you get 20% off if you pick up uh, the leaflet from them. But I'm not here to promote that book. Um, <clears throat> But let me actually take this opportunity to promote a book, because yesterday evening I attended a book launch, um, and it was James Halliday's book, Yes for, Scot yes for Scotland. Um, and on the front cover of that book, there's a photograph, and it's the photograph of the 1956 SNP conference, and all the delegates, all the delegates there. On the back cover of the book, there's a photograph as well, and it's all SNP MSPs elected this year. Suffice to say, there are more people in the photograph on the back of the book than on the front of the book. And what James has done in his book, in a very personal way, in a very interesting way, and in an incredibly lucid and well-written way, is to explain from his point of view how that transition has taken place. If I'm honest, Derek, I would strongly recommend that book even more than my own book, if you want to understand Spark. But don't tell my publisher I said that. One of the figures, of course, in that photograph is Arthur Donaldson, and I'm delighted to be invited again to deliver this lecture in memory of this man who represents a generation, indeed generations, who've campaigned tirelessly in the wilderness over years and decades. From what I know of him and from what I heard of him, about him last evening at the book launch, had he been present at this conference, even after such an historic victory for your party, Mr. Donaldson would probably be amongst the first to remind you that you've no reason to be too self-satisfied and that you've still got much work to do. But I want to argue today that while Arthur Donaldson would undoubtedly remain dissatisfied with Scotland's constitutional status today, there's been much that has changed and Scotland has been altered fundamentally over the years. This lecture is in part, indeed largely, my reflections on some of these changes. And I would suggest reflections on an achievement that has gone by almost unnoticed and uncelebrated. It's therefore appropriate, I think, that I should go back to that 1994 lecture, that Donaldson lecture, Derek, you referred to. I delivered that lecture 
to an SNP conference in the city, indeed in this very hall. I particularly remember spending the remainder of that weekend, I don't remember much about the lecture, but I remember the remainder of that weekend as guests of Ali and Neil Stephen on Sky, along with Andrew Wilson and Scott Martin. A lot's changed since then, older, wiser, more mature, perhaps more boring. I'm talking about myself, not the SNP conferences, of course. My theme then was that Scottish politics operated in the shadow of political events in 1979, that our politics had been shaped in very unhealthy ways by the outcome of the referendum and the general election of that year. It affected all political parties, it affected our political culture, it affected our institutions. I argued then that Scotland needed to move out of the shadow of 79 in order to move forward. The referendum and general election had ushered in a debilitating form of grievance politics in my mind. Scottish politics were oppositional, negative. The dwindling band of Tories apart, Scots knew what they opposed. <clears throat> Our energy, time, talent and imagination were expended in opposition rather than the creative endeavour to build a better Scotland. Indeed, it's fair to say that our politics were largely defined by opposition to change. Ironically, the party of change back then was the Conservative Party, while its opponents all sought to defend the status quo in some sense. Even support for the Scottish Parliament was often motivated by stopping Thatcher at the border, a defensive, conservative motive. In the 80s and 90s, much of the problem facing Mrs Thatcher's Conservatives was not simply that their policies were unpopular, and indeed many were, but no matter what they did, even had they pursued potentially popular policies, they would still have a problem, simply because they were perceived to be an alien force. In the language of the time, the Tories lacked a Scottish mandate. A legitimacy problem lay at the heart of our politics. One of the great unnoticed achievements of the Scottish Parliament has been the restoration of legitimacy to our system of government. Your party political opponents may not like the fact that you're in government, I get that sense, but they accept the legitimacy of an SNP government. Equally, you may not be satisfied with the existing constitutional arrangements, again, that's the sense I get from most of you, if not all of you, but accept that what we have is legitimate, and you must work within these arrangements until the Scottish people give you a mandate for further change. How things have changed 32 years on from the first devolution referendum. 1979 seems like a date from another era. Indeed, it is. The second referendum in 1997 allowed us finally to move out of that debilitating shadow. We've exercised that ghost. I want to now consider what has changed? I don't want to focus on the most obvious change, the rise of this party to government, something that seemed inconceivable to many, including some in this hall, I'm sure, at the time of my first Donaldson lecture, and certainly in the aftermath of the first referendum. I want to focus on the changing politics of national identity and its implications for, the, for Scotland's political future. I want to start by going further back. <clears throat> For much of the 20th century, there was a fear that Scottish identity was under threat. Many of the founders of your party and those who became key figures, including people like Arthur Donaldson, during its long years in the wilderness, saw the preservation of Scotland as a nation as central to their activities. In his book published in 1973, Billy Wolfe explained that he joined the, the party in 1962 because of the threat to the sort of survival of Scotland as a nation. This caused concern on the part of the SNP's founders and many of its early activists found expression in academic but debates too, though from a very different standpoint. An orthodoxy emerged amongst political scientists and sociologists in the 50s and 60s. This view saw the world as divided between modern and traditional societies. This categorisation of the world was even thought by some scholars to have become more important than the distinction between totalitarian and democratic systems of government. According to this view, this orthodoxy, modernisation, which was broadly defined as a combination of urbanisation, industrialisation, secularisation, modern technology, would eradicate or at least dilute traditional local identities, identities such as Scottish identity. Defenders of such traditional identities were seen in the academic community, um, as at least by many, as out-of-date throwbacks from a backward, pre-modern era. No, of course, people like Arthur Donaldson, 
The key elements of modernisation, of course, proved more complex and temporary than many commentators expected. Urbanisation often gave way to suburbanisation in advanced democracies, and smaller towns grew as some large cities declined. Inverness is a good example of a small town that grew. The process is different across the world. Industrialisation is a process of homogenisation, with large, sometimes huge workforces employed in similar types of uh, activities, gave way to much more diverse employment practices and forms of businesses and industries. Secularisation that was supposed to lead to the eradication of differences well, just did not happen. Religions did not decline. And even in secular societies, religious teachings and values remain significant and important, even if not always acknowledged. This Orthodoxy was a view expressed in very simple, clear terms, a dichotomy, traditional versus modern societies, in which all that was traditional was seen to stand in the way of modern, progressive societies. Parties like the SNP, those who campaigned to maintain a Scottish sense of identity, were seen as backward in this period. It led to a belief in the era of the melting pot, the world it was thought, and hoped by many who wrote about it, was becoming a village in which differences would be eradicated. This was particularly notable within state it was, states, it was claimed. The world and states within it were coming together in a global village, and states were becoming more homogenous. Differences and diversity stood in the way of this new, brave new world. Such predictions of the integration of society, or the assimilation of society rather, were innocent and proved spectacularly wrong. They were innocent insofar as they were based on a genuine, if misguided, view that the world would be a better place if we could avoid differences. But they were also wrong. Some of the very forces that were supposed to bring about this modern, integrated, assimilated world strengthened so-called traditional identities and communities. Modern communication and media may have made it possible to bring distant places into our homes. Under John Reed, Reith, the BBC's mission was indeed to entrench a British national, indeed imperial identity. Reith saw this BBC standing above regional and sectional interests in anything threatening the integrity of the state. And the state itself played a part in creating a sense of common identity. In the case of the United Kingdom, the welfare state was thought to have contributed to the sense of Britishness been claimed by many British politicians, especially Labour politicians, that the British welfare state has been a fundamental building block in the development of a sense, a modern sense of Britishness. Nye Bevan, founder of the National Health Service and himself a Welshman, is often associated with this view, and his comments on Wales as a political entity are frequently quoted in this context. In fact, Bevan was much more complex, sophisticated than, than is often suggested. Nonetheless, the beliefs in a British National Health Service and British welfare state have been potent in feeding into the notion that integration of communities and progress went together. But these forces of modernisation had other effects too. Technology also allowed for the development of distinct, more local media, for example. The BBC was soon able to transmit radio broadcasts within and to the component parts of the United Kingdom. The first BBC television broadcast in Scotland took place in March 1952. Scottish television was given its licence to broadcast, and also, of course, that licence to print money, as was often famously said, as Scotland's first commercial television station in 1955, coming on air at the end of August 1957. Bringing the world into people's homes often had the opposite effect from that expected by modernists. Instead of making everyone feel closer, it highlighted differences about which many people might otherwise have only been half conscious. The paradox of identity is that people, until people become aware of other identities, they are unlikely to be aware of their own. Indeed, a community might be more distinct from its neighbours at one point in time, but be unaware of this and lack a collective sense of itself. It's possible that a community may be less distinct in a later period than an earlier period, but by being aware of its distinctiveness, may have a stronger sense of its own identity. 
This may explain the paradox described by Paul Scott in his superb autobiography. As Paul noted, Scotland of the 80s had also become more conscious of its distinctiveness and more anxious to preserve it against the pressure for global conformity. But paradoxically, it had become markedly less distinctively Scottish in practice. Until fairly recently, of course, Scottish identity was debated endlessly with a backdrop of fear that it was under threat. My shelves heave with books and articles on the subject, some of which I've contributed to. An identity in crisis, ill at ease, or perceived to be under threat, is one that will be the subject of endless discussion, books, debates, and speculation. The date, of course, has not ended, but there's been a marked change. There's less urgency to discussions today, and the reason is extremely simple. The sense of a threat to Scottish identity has receded. And one of the main political achievements of the Scottish Parliament has been to restore legitimacy to our system of government, that its main social achievement may have been to allow us, as Scots, to be much more at ease with a sense of ourselves. In this sense, in this sense at least, one of the key objectives of Arthur Donaldson and others with him has already been achieved. Even before the Parliament came into being, a vibrant sense of Scottish identity had become established. George Caravan once wrote that there had been an explosion of cultural activity in Scotland in the 70s and 80s and referred to this as a, a declaration of cultural independence. A number of messages from all of this. First, Identities are more resilient than was once thought. Some of the processes that were expected to diminish, if not eradicate, many identities proved either more complex or less durable than the national identities they were expected to erase. Part of the reason for this, resi this uh, resilience is the adaptability and multifarious nature of each identity. Even in a room full of people with a shared national identity, and I guess this room may come close to being such a room, there will be a multitude of different understandings of the meaning of this identity. That does not mean that the identity doesn't exist or is false, only that it is varied. Identities are fluid, multiple, contingent. An individual's identity is not static. In the space of one day, we will have multiple identities. There will be many people in this hall tomorrow morning around 11 o'clock, I suspect, men and women whose gender identity will come to the fore when you debate gender balance. That does not mean that your national identities or any other identities have been forgotten, but only highlights the contingent nature of identity. Show me someone with only one identity, and I will show you a diminished, indeed a sad person. As Neil McCormick, another former Donaldson lecturer, expressed it many years ago, there's more than one form of grouping within which individuals may find a sense of identity or of community with others. It seems wrong to rank them in terms of more or less absolute claims of loyalty. This does not mean that the old debates on the meaning of Scottish identity are resolved. That is an insoluble question that will be faced by each new generation, not least because it is constantly changing. But it is a debate that has less urgency. In essence, Scottish identity is no longer the problem it was often perceived to be throughout the late 20th century. Scots are far more at ease with their sense of who they are today. The lack or at least decline in debates do not signal defeat, but confidence. We're more relaxed in our sense of who we are now than has been the case for a very long time. One very healthy consequence is that we can now be more relaxed about alternative and complementary identities too. But there is an identity that was once taken for granted that has now assumed the same troubled status that Scottish identity had until recently. What does it mean to be British today? Britishness is now under debate as never before. There's less debate on the meaning of Scottishness now than at any stage since the SNP became a force in politics. One level, one level, the SNP can take comfort from this, as it might suggest that there's a crisis of confidence in Britishness and Britain. 
It would, however, I would suggest, be wrong to assume that these debates and evidence showing that the people of Scotland identify increasingly as Scots, that this means that Britishness will disappear or even continue to decline. That would be to make the same mistake that was made by those who believed that modernisation would lead to the eradication of so-called traditional identities like Scottish identity. There are two ways of viewing the relationship between Britishness and Scottishness. One sees this as a zero-sum game. That is, as one identity rises, the other must fall in equal significance. This is the view of competing identities in a fight to the death. The other way, the other way of understanding this relationship it sees identities as complex, multiple, contingent, and contextual. The supposed crisis of British identity is more, I suggest, a crisis of the UK state. The UK is a post-imperial state that's yet to come to terms with its position in the world. Devolution, immigration, the European Union, and much else besides have contributed to this problem as it's perceived in the eyes of many. What has been most obvious about these debates on Britishness, especially contributions from politicians, has been the difficulty in defining what it means to be British. Some narrow and dangerously parochial tests have been suggested. In 1990, Norman Tebbett proposed, of course, his infamous t cricket test. Mr Tebbett suggested that a proportion of the UK public failed the cricket test. As he said, which side do they cheer for? It's an interesting test. Are you still harking back to where you came from or where you are? He asked. Mr Tebbett was, of course, commenting on recent immigrants to the United Kingdom. But it always struck me that he had inadvertently undermined his own staunch support for a centralised United Kingdom. After all, if the cricket test was applied in Scotland, it would not only be recent immigrants who'd fail his test, given Scots' propensity to support whichever team England is playing any sport. Well, you certainly would have failed that test. <laughs> But that test has been rejected by all main political parties, including, including Mr Tebbett's party itself, the party he once chaired, and that's to be welcomed. But let us be very clear as to why the test is to be rejected. And with regard to any national identity, British, Scottish or whatever, the Tebbett test conflates identity with citizenship and belonging to a state. And identity is something that cannot be legislated for and must always be a matter of personal choice. Whether an individual sees him or herself as British, Scottish, Asian, Irish, English, or any number or combination of identities should not determine whether or not they belong to a state. Of course, the best responses to the Tebbit test came from William McIlvanny, who delivered the second Donaldson lecture when he described Scotland as a mongrel nation. And of course, also from the late Bashar Ahmed, who famously said at this party's conference 16 years ago that it isn't important where you come from. What matters is where we're going to as a nation. What was, that was not a denial of his roots, but an acknowledgement that those with diverse roots who would celebrate those roots could travel together. Now, of course, all states require a basic minimum of loyalty and sense of belonging from its citizens. This is usually manifest in a corresponding national identity, but it need not happen. This state that we live in today, the United Kingdom, for example, has never had a clear national identity that corresponds with the state as a whole. British is only an approximation. As Richard Rose, a, a colleague of mine, famously noted many years ago, no one speaks of the Ukes as a nation. The United Kingdom, of course, is not the same as Britain. You may be tempted to conclude that the UK's lack of a corresponding national identity shows how artificial or false the UK is as a state. That temptation too should be resisted. The absence of any concern or even awareness of this unusual state of affairs reflected actually the strength, not the weakness, of the sense of belonging. There was no need to develop a sense of UK national identity, at least until recently.
There have been some definitions, of course, of Britishness that focus on institutions, others on values. And there are major problems with each of these. Defining an identity with reference to inanimate institutions only makes sense if people associate strongly with such institutions. Even then, problems arise when institutions lose support. If the Westminster Parliament was a central institution of British identity, then Britishness would indeed be in crisis, given the contempt that's grown up in recent years for that institution. Defining Britishness in terms of values has proved difficult too. Those who have attempted to do so by suggesting that Britishness is defined in terms of shared values run up against even more significant problems. What are these shared British values? Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown lists British values as liberty, civic duty, fair play, enterprise and internationalism. But what makes these British values? If an identity has distinguished a people from others, including its neighbours, then can we really say these are British or indeed Scottish values? Are these not values that many people across the world subscribe to? Does that make the supporter of liberty, civic duty, fair play, enterprise and international side at the other side of the world, does that make that person British? Attempts to define the essence of Britishness will prove as illusory as those to find the essence of Scottishness. The problem in trying to find some defining characteristic in any national identity is that the exercise itself misses the point. A national identity is a subjective personal matter which can and will change. What to find one person's sense of national identity may be very different from another. But this debate on Britishness is an opportunity to help shape that debate, perhaps even find some common ground with some of your opponents. But it is certainly an opportunity to set out what is understood by you of, uh, of your politics. This is now widely acknowledged. Independence does not mean the end of all links with the rest of the United Kingdom, or RUK, as it's now coming to be called. Independence is not autarky. It doesn't mean creating a separate, wholly self-sufficient state isolated from its neighbours. If RUK refers to the rest of the United Kingdom, what term should we use to describe the continued links within these isles? You see, it strikes me that these are in fact British links. For those who do not share your political outlook and objectives, British links would be more, in some cases, far more extensive, of course. The absence of a term, an adjective, for the continued links gives the impression that there will be no continued links. It strikes me that Britishness is as useful and accurate a description of the collective of continued links within these isles as anything else. Let me now consider briefly some of these British continuities. The first and most obvious, indeed ineradical, form of Britishness is that associated with our common past. The relevance of parts of our past will wax and wane in significance, but never disappear. And of course our recent past will always be quite literally present. Regardless of Scotland's constitutional status, we will be affected for years and decades to come by this recent past. Some of this will be welcome, some very unwelcome. No one suggests, for example, that we should rip up the achievements uh, associated with the establishment of the welfare state. Neil Asherson, who, another Donaldson lecturer back in 1996, has recently suggested that what you are doing as a party is trying to build, quote, a kind of Hadrian's Wall behind which the very best of British post-war settlement will be preserved. They, that is you, are saying behind this wall we will preserve what's left of British social democracy. What we can save, not all, what is, can't, what is gone can't be recovered, but what is left we will defend here, and only independence can really do that. Mr. Asherson suggests that what you are promoting is the very best of British social democracy. <laughs> In this case, I would imagine, however, you would seek to turn that into a distinctively Scottish welfare state, especially if, as seems probable over the next few years, UK governments pursue strategies that diverge markedly from past British practice. There will also be, of course, an inherited national debt, a British national debt. How this is handled is open to debate. It may be split between Scotland and our UK, but whatever happens, the part of our common British past that created this debt will cast a shadow, potentially as damaging to our politics and society as the shadow of 79 did, which I referred to at the start of this lecture. 
There are many other dimensions to Britishness that will remain. Some of these have become conflated <coughs> with ideas of union. This conflation of notions of union and national identity is unfortunate, but probably inevitable. It's unfortunate for the reasons mentioned earlier. Notions of identity are only loosely associated with constitutional and political structures, but it is inevitable. Just as the past is ineradicable, neither can we wipe the slate clean, clean and pretend that existing terms of debate can be eradicated. Since at least the 1970s, the SNP has intermittently referred to a social union. This social union must surely be a British social union. It's only been vaguely described and defined. Again, this vagueness contributes to the polarisation of debate, a sense that everything will disappear if your objectives are met. The British social union is a term that's been used, of course, differently by different people. What I'm referring to here are the family and personal links, the cultural links, that will continue regardless of Scotland's constitution of status. Others have attempted to define that much more narrowly to capture that language. The Cullman Commission defined the social union as concerned with, quote, some common expectations about social welfare. This is a good example of the attempt to define a common set of values that I was referring to earlier. The problem with the Common Commission's definition of a social union is there is an absence of common expectations about social value, welfare. There is no union. That will become increasingly clear over the next few years. What are these common expectations? Are they contained in the coalition government's proposals for welfare reform at Westminster? What are the limits to social union, union that would reduce welfare? Calman social union looks set to disappear if it exists, while the SNP social union will endure. Who would have thought it? The SNP is the true social unionist party. <laughs> And there are other British institutions and unions that are the subject of debate. The Union of Crowns is the original British institution. Support for and against that union cuts across political parties, at least on the left. It was this union, after all, that was the original union referred to in those parties by those parties and politicians that called themselves unionists in much of the 20th century. The old Scottish Unionist Party that operated here between 1912 and 1965, and who knows, depending on the outcome of a, a leadership contest, may yet reappear. That was a party that, that emphasised its support for a social union between people in Scotland and people in Ireland and adherence to the Union of Crowns. If we were to take language seriously, we could argue that Republicans, regardless of their views on whether Scotland should be constitutionally independent, are not unionists. What should we call these people? This is not an invitation, this is a rhetorical question, I'm not inviting a response. What should we call those who oppose independence but would end the monarchy? Are they unionists? Clearly they're not unionists in the original sense. I raise this with only one purpose in mind, to emphasise the many forms of union and the many forms of Britishness that can exist. I'm not so naive as to imagine, and certainly not at such a late stage in the debate, that we can alter the terms of the debate. But just occasionally, it's worth considering these matters, at least to be clear as to what is being proposed and what is being opposed. We're entering an important phase in Scotland's constitutional politics, a time for serious debate. This debate needs to draw in larger numbers of people than have traditionally engaged in politics. It will be adversarial and at times raucous. I'm unsure whether this manner of debate can best be described as Scottish or British. But for the sake of clarity and good debate, there also needs to be a debate that allows us to see the real parameters of what is being proposed. Let me conclude by emphasising that a continuing British identity poses no threat to Scots who are no longer cursed with fear that necessitated endlessly dwelling on their Scottishness. The complexities of past and present experience that contribute to the ongoing evolution of Scottish identity add to its richness and diversity, producing an identity and a politics well suited for engagement in this complex, interdependent world. Thank you.